Good evening, and welcome to worship here at Oak Ridge Church. My name is Tim Archibald. I'm the minister here, and we're glad that you've chosen to join us this night on Holy Thursday. Uh, together around the table and together around the word, tonight we receive both word and sacrament together. Our Lord comes to us in grace, and this table is open to anyone who loves and trusts our Lord. For Christians, this is the holiest of weeks in the year. We follow Jesus on the way of the cross so that we might know him better and better and that we might receive the divine life more intimately from him. On this day, Jesus gathered with his disciples in an upper room and he gave us the feast of the Lord's Supper communion, the Eucharist, this holy feast of bread and wine, a sign and seal of his self-giving grace and love. It was also on this night that our Lord washed the feet of his disciples, giving us an example and a command that we should humbly love others in the same way that he loved us. And on this night as well, Christ invited his disciples to watch and pray with him in Gethsemane. And then he gave himself into the hands of sinners for our salvation. Let us worship. Let us pray. We thank you, loving God, that on this night, Jesus gave us a new commandment that we should love one another. Just as you, Lord Jesus, have loved us, we long to love others. We pray that your love would grow rich and deep in us and that it would indeed prove that we are your disciples. Holy God, you indeed are the source of all love and grace. And on this, the night of your betrayal, Lord Jesus, you teach us the depths of what love for one another looks like. By your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would write your commandment of love on our hearts and that you would pour into us the very love of Christ that always longs to serve others with joy. Teach us, Lord Jesus, to be generous, to be able to serve you as you deserve, to be able to give and not to count the cost, to struggle and not to heed the wounds, to labor and not to seek for any reward except simply to know that we are doing your holy will. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
seated. This evening's scripture reading is from Mark 14, verses 12 to 25. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him. And whenever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This is the word of God. seated. Have you ever had a chance to celebrate a Passover meal or a Seder before? The Passover actually is the most supreme festival in Judaism. It's, you could say it's the most important festival of the whole year. It's the where the salvation story of God delivering his people from slavery in Egypt is told, and about the Passover lamb and the blood that saves them from death and brings them to freedom. 
Well, despite Jesus' imminent betrayal on this night, it's hard to think of how he could possibly think of anything else, but he still wants to celebrate this most supreme festival and to share the Passover with his disciples. And usually the Passover is celebrated around a table in a home, and so they prepare the Passover together. But this Last Supper that Jesus will have with his disciples will become the Lord's Supper. In this meal, it will say everything that Jesus most wants to say to his disciples. And because this Lord's Supper will get repeated time and time again, this is what it will continue to say for the people of God for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, making them the people who depend on his death for their life. But this would be a Passover meal with a difference. Through it, Jesus explains through more than just words about what his crucifixion is going to mean. He's kind of giving them a bit of a prep talk, you could say, so they might understand what's going to unfold before their eyes even in the next 24 hours. Not that they're going to hear it, really, maybe at that time. But more than just explaining it by talking about it, Jesus is going to demonstrate it before their eyes, using some of the same elements that would have been used for the Passover itself. And this transition from Passover meal, Last Supper to Lord's Supper, will continue to feed Jesus' followers so that we can make this story our own and continue to draw life and strength from it. If we want to be nourished by what happens on the cross, then this is the place to begin. This is the meal that is the place where it starts because this is the mirror of what happens on the cross. This is Jesus' primary means of enabling his followers to understand his death but also to let its freedom work be done in them and in their lives and in the life of the world. In the gospel, this Last Supper that Jesus celebrates with his disciples is actually the only meal that Jesus hosts because you know he was always the guest. He was the guest in many homes, whether rich or poor, but this meal is the only one where he is the host. And it's interesting because at this meal, even though he is the host, he is not among them as a triumphant Lord. He is among them as a foot-washing servant or slave. As Jesus says earlier, I am among you as a diaconus, or maybe you've heard it as a deacon translated that way. What, what the word means is really basically as someone who serves food at a table. Yeah. Jesus is entirely directed towards the needs of others at every moment in his life. And so even at this table, when he hosts this meal that night, he's reversing the roles. And so although he's the host, it's almost like he, the master, steps out of that role, and even though he gathers all of his slaves, servants around him, as the master, he goes and he washes all of their feet. He's the master, 
but he takes the role of the slave. He reverses. So at this table, there is a reversal that happens and that is meant to keep happening in the life of the church where the one who leads is meant to serve table service, which might seem like very ordinary work. But that's our call. You could say that by serving them the food and drink, he enacts a pattern for serving that is part of Christian ministry. Yet, as Mark's gospel indicates, Jesus already knows that one of the people around the table that night is going to betray him for money. And so this night, Judas Iscariot will betray him with a kiss. And when he's arrested, the rest of the disciples will flee into the night and totally abandon him. Even Peter, the so-called rock, will also abandon him and deny him even. Not once, not twice, but three times he will say that he does not know Jesus. One of you will betray me, Jesus says, one who is eating with me now. And distress fills the whole room. But notice what happens next in the story. You know, sometimes when we get under pressure, we end up saying things maybe that we wouldn't normally say. Do you ever end up saying the wrong thing and then regret uh, what you might have said, you know, when, when things are getting heavy and there's a lot going on and it's hard to keep everything straight. And you could imagine on a night like that, Jesus already knowing what was going to happen, that there'd be a lot of pressure. But he doesn't rail against Judas. Rather, he really only grieves the torment that is going to happen to the one who betrays him. And suddenly, we begin to see already that from this table, there's a, there's a grace that begins to emanate and to spread from here. A grace that is able to outmatch all sin and failure, no matter how great it is. And so, at this table, a forgiveness is offered that is more powerful, more powerful than anything that we can do. Here at this table, a love is shown that is incomprehensible. You could say that Jesus is setting the table with his life. It was Dutch spiritual writer Henry Nouwen who wrote that the Last Supper is God's determination to show the fullness of his forgiving love. And so, that means that this is also the table of new beginnings. This is the table that defines who we are as the followers of Jesus. And through it, we remember that someone saves us and that our freedom from sin and death comes at the cost of a person. We remember that God, walking in human flesh, suffered and died for us. This is the big story. And if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, we need to get this story. We have to see ourselves at this supper, and we need to see ourselves at the cross, knowing that it was for each one of us that Jesus died. And so every time that we take this bread and that we share this cup, we remember, and it reshapes who we are, both as individuals and, and as a community as well. 
So Jesus took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, take, this is my body. And then he took a cup. And giving thanks for it, he said, this is my blood, the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. The words and the actions are really quite simple. Yet, as an American scholar Martin Marty reminds us, the Lord's Supper is not just about our forgiveness and how it was won. The Lord's Supper is our forgiveness. It is the forgiveness of sins. The Lord's Supper is God in action coming to us to offer the grace of forgiveness, affecting forgiveness here and now, making us new. And so Christ uses bread and wine to come into our midst by faith to affect our forgiveness so that we can experience his grace. And when we break and eat this bread, and when we drink from this cup, it's meant to be that we are really there at the cross. That Jesus is really there with us. That he loves us. And that he lifts our burden from us. As sinners who come to this table, we don't just talk about forgiveness. But at this table, our forgiveness is effected. Communion is for sinners in need of grace and forgiveness. And it is a sacrament, a sacred moment, which imparts the grace from Christ and sets us free. Because the Word of God, as important as it is to us, it's our life, but there needs to be a way to show that word. The action of this table of receiving bread and wine affects our forgiveness. And here at this table, it's, it's kind of like a, a foretaste of the kingdom of God here and now. When people will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God, we catch a foretaste of what that looks like every time that we gather at this table. Jesus' kingdom begins to take visible form here, and we see the kind of kingdom that Jesus intends for the whole world, a place where sinners are welcomed and forgiven, and where the poor are invited, where the hungry are fed, and where everyone is able to find a place at the table. Finally, the Lord's Supper invites us as we turn and leave from here to then turn and look to the famine in the world around us, where Christ longs for us in turn to do as he has done here, to break open our lives for the love of others for the service of others. Because there are others in the world who need to experience the good news of this table and who don't have a place to know it. And so here we taste the new creation on our lips, in our tongues, in our bodies, so that we can go out and go forth and let Jesus, through our living, through our serving, through our hospitality, to enable others to be able to taste the mercy of Jesus and his new life in their lives. Amen.
Please be seated. On this night, gathered around a table among friends, Jesus broke the bread. And the Last Supper became the Lord's Supper. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he gave thanks and poured out the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. You see, the table is a mirror of the cross. For every time we share this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes again in glory. And these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us give thanks and let us say thank you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for sending Jesus into our midst to illustrate your will for us clearly. And even knowing in advance that his closest friends would betray, deny, and desert him, he chose to take the lowest place and in humble service wash those deserters grimy feet and make them clean. And not only them. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you desire to take our dirty feet, to take our wounded hearts, and to make them clean, forgiven, and whole. In you, Lord Jesus, we see the true magnificence of love and grace. You show us how to love tenderly, completely, and without condition, expecting nothing in return. And this is not what our feeble, humble, human love looks like. No, this is what love powered and shaped by you looks like. And we are in awe. Wash us fully in that kind of love. Drown us. Drown that old, feeble, limited love that we have. And raise in us this new, magnificent love that is willing to get its hands dirty in the messiness of life. That is willing to give without expecting in return, that's willing to let others get close, to do for us even, so that we can allow others to serve us and even touch our feet so that we can know that we are fully loved. Remind us again that by your cross and passion, that you have opened a door that has unleashed a flood of this kind of grace and love that can flow out to us and find shape in our actions when we seek your will above our own. And tonight, you show us how to put the will of your Father above all else, and you change us forever. We give you thanks. Lord Jesus Christ, come, Holy Spirit, be poured out tonight on these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become for us the body and blood of Christ, 
and that nourished by them, that we can become the body of Christ, living and serving in the world. Lead us, Holy Spirit, with your life in us to love as you love, to lay down our lives for others, to break open our lives for others. Help us so to live with humility and with persistent courage. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This evening, I invite you to a simple celebration of communion. Sonia is going to uh, join me at the front here. And uh, she will have both a, a regular bread and a gluten-free option. You're welcome to uh, give your offering in the plate that is here and then pick up the bread, eat the bread, and I'll give you the cup and there's a basket to receive the cups and you can return to your seat. So we'll invite you to come out to this aisle. Everyone come forward and then you can return uh, through the other aisle this evening. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Here is Christ coming to us in bread and wine. Thank you. 
Let us pray. We lift up our hearts to you, Lord Jesus, thankful. Thankful for the gift of this meal. Thank you for bread that we can taste. Thank you for a cup that we can drink. Thankful that we can know your love for us. When you came to host this dinner and became our servant, setting the table with your life, giving your body, giving your blood, your very life to be our life, forgiving us in grace and making us your people. We pray that through this sacrament that you would write your commandments of love on our hearts so that as those who have come to this table and who have received you as you broke open your life for us and shared it, Strengthen us in service that we may prepare to go and turn towards the famine in the world and see where you would help us serve you there, Lord Jesus, as your hands and your feet that we might break open our lives and humbly wash the feet of others and love as you love. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, I welcome you to Oak Ridge Church, and I'm so thankful that you've come tonight, and especially if you've come for the first time, if tonight's your first time in our midst, we're especially glad to be able to welcome you. We hope that you'll feel at home here and take a moment or two. We may not have coffee for you tonight uh, after worship, but uh, please take a moment uh, to connect with us. And uh, we'll look forward to journeying on with Jesus further. Tomorrow morning, our service uh, uh, for Good Friday is at 10 a.m. And if you would like to come for breakfast, uh, there are some gentlemen in our congregation who would love to set the table for you and uh, hope that you can come and sit at their table uh, tomorrow morning. And you can come at 8 or between 8 and 9.30. Yeah, so you've got an hour and a half window. You can even sleep in a little bit if you'd like to. And, uh, and then join us for worship uh, at 10 o'clock. And then, of course, on Sunday, we will celebrate uh, the resurrection together. And uh, we will not only uh, share the sacrament of communion at that time, but we'll also uh, share in the sacrament of baptism. And uh, we'll have five baptisms and uh, we'll receive uh, nine new members uh, here at Oak Ridge Church. And so we hope you can join us for that celebratory uh, service on Sunday. And we've been grateful for all of the the music that has been worked on and prepared, and especially we are grateful for our guest cellist tonight, and so grateful that we are going to see you again tomorrow. So welcome, so glad to have you with us tonight, yeah. Well, let's prepare to go forth into the world. Let us go singing.
It is our call to go forth and to love one another as Christ has loved us so that through our love that Christ, the others may know that we are Jesus' disciples and be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.